Now I would like to introduce Blake Dinius with The Secret Lives of Bugs. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, so glad to be here. So um, what is this like maybe round four or five that we've done this? I've been doing this for quite a while now and it's always a lot of fun to come here and talk about insects, which is one of my favorite topics. Um, let's go ahead and click through. So today we're going to be talking about the secret lives of bugs. And there are, you know, the title itself is um, maybe doesn't encompass it all of the secret parts of insect lives. Uh, I'm mostly going to focus tonight on how insects spend the winter and what they're doing. A lot of times people, you know, they, they wonder, where have the bugs gone? Where are they all dead now? Uh, and um, I'm not going to spoil anything yet, but uh, no, they're not. They're, they're doing their own, they have their own different strategies for how they handle the cold. So, I mean, kind of just this picture of like maybe your, your typical New England winter. Um, you've got some snow here covering the ground. You know, the water's pretty cold. Uh, there are, isn't a lot of food around here. You know, when you think about pollinating insects, this is definitely not the image you would picture. Uh, when you go outside, you may even have some a lot of difficulty finding insects around this. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I say that th it's the typical New England winter, but I mean, let's be honest, uh, New England weather is is more more or less looks like this, um, where the days might be sixty, might be minus twenty. Who knows? Rain. I don't know. It's kind of a wild card. And uh, so as someone who likes to do a lot of uh, winter activities, I can say that the winters recently have been more uh, more of a letdown, more on the sunny-ish side. And, uh, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of opportunities to go ice fishing, for instance, or, you know, and then a lot of, I know a lot of mountains uh, and, uh, are, are now producing a lot more snow and the snow is a little bit less natural. But um so how do you know? What, again, kind of going back to the topic at hand, um, uh, what do insects do? Um, a lot of people think that they go away. You know, I like this meme on a positive note. I haven't seen any mosquitoes in weeks. Uh, I hate to say it for you, um, mosquitoes are still around. They're even around right now. Uh, you can see based on this chart that several mosquito species, uh, they are, and these are mosquito gene genera right here on the left. Uh, several of them spend the winter as adults. And you may not see them because they're engaging in something called diapause, where they really are very inactive and they may even spend their time in these very cryptic locations. Um, some of these insects engage in something called negative phototaxis, where they actually go away from light. So they're actually looking to hide in the deep, dark crevices of maybe our sheds. So if you were to walk into your shed now, up in the top corners of your shed, um, in some of these really hidden locations, there may be mosquitoes just sitting there, not really doing all that much. And they're not going to bite you necessarily, but they may be there. And you can see right here, um, this is a photo uh, taken from um, someone on, on a website called Bug Guide. And they they found this Culex pipiens mosquito uh, on January 13th. So they're they're definitely still around, and that's an adult. Insects are are wild, right? So they have accomplished ways to survive in many of the coldest parts of our planet. So not just here in New England, you know, you think all the way up into the Arctic and even Antarctic, like this woolly bear caterpillar, for instance, this is an Arctic woolly bear. And I love this because you can see that the ice even creeps up and touches that caterpillar. Yet this caterpillar may go through several, I, I believe it's up to seven winters uh, it takes this caterpillar to complete its life cycle. So it's, and it's actually, uh, in a lot of the places in the Arctic, these insects will actually uh, not um, spend their time, not die pause in underneath leaves or snow. They'll actually move into rock crevices where they're actually fully exposed to the air temps and uh, ice may, may move in and actually touch their bodies. You actually even have insects in the Antarctic, right? So this is not many, uh, I believe, you know, mostly just the Antarctic midge and then some kind of in arthropods that are not really true insects, like a lot of mites and springtails will also be in the Antarctic. But there are, you know, insects are even in the Antarctic. 
And then glaciers as well. You think that uh, the top of a glacier or even on glaciers would not be a suitable habitat for insects. Yet here we are looking at an insect that spends its time on glaciers, right? So this is a winter active midge, uh, which is absolutely crazy. Um, and especially, you know, here at home. So th there's definitely going to be insects that are around even now. So how the heck do they do it, right? Uh, insects are what we call poikilotherms. And that's a fancy word. You can throw it out around at your dinner parties when you're talking to your friends and neighbors, trying to impress them. Uh, a lot of times people will refer to insects as cold-blooded or ectotherms. And that's, you know, technically not fully true. Uh, it's one of those things where you might be able to point out and be like, actually, it, they're poikilotherms. And the real major difference is that insects have the capacity to warm their bodies um, with behavioral techniques. So like an ectotherm may not, you know, is something that is going to be dependent on its environment for heat, but an insect actually has the ability to do that, to, to engage with the environment and move around and find places where it can maybe bask in the sun. Like you can see these dragonflies moderating their, their bodies. Um, on the left, the photo, you have a dragonfly that's obelisking. So that's actually during a, a period of time where it's too hot. So right around midday, that dragonfly will make its surface area as narrow, as small as possible, like pointing upwards towards the sun. So the fewer sun's rays are hitting that dragonfly's body. And then on a colder period of time, you can see this dragonfly on the right, where it's spreading its body wide open and as many sun's rays are hitting that body to warm it up. So that's essentially what this means. Uh, so what the heck do insects do when it's cold, right? So it, you can see that the insects can kind of um, control how many of the sun's rays are hitting their body and control the heat, the amount of heat that they're receiving at that point. Um, when they're cold in the winter, um, what are some of the strategies that they engage with so that they don't die, so that the, the cold doesn't actually kill them, right? And to this end, many strategies have actually involve, evolved to protect them. And th this is not comprehensive, but these are ex these ex these are some examples of some of the major strategies that insects engage with. And some of them may engage in several of these. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. You may have an insect that undergoes uh, migration and diapause or, you know, diapause and free, free, uh, freeze avoidance. They may have cryoprotectants or they may have changes to their cuticle. All these, they may mix and match. Um, in general, you, you, you can even have insects that may be freeze tolerant sometimes and then freeze avoidant other times, right? Or they may be even shifting. Like we've been learning in some species, you have freeze tolerant insects that have now shifted to, um, to a, to certain subspecies that are now freeze avoidant. And then in other species of insects, you may have freeze avoidant, uh, subspecies of freeze avoidant that is now shifting towards freeze tolerance. So again, these are not very discreet and there's a lot of overlap. They engage with multiple different types of strategies. Uh, migration is a pretty simple strategy. I think we all kind of are familiar with this. I'm sure that you all didn't carve out time on Monday night for me to talk about, talk about migration, but you know, it's one of the simplest behavioral techniques that uh, that insects can engage with, where they just move to someplace warmer. But again, even your monarch butterfly does go through a period of diapause once it hits that winter, uh, once it hits Mexico, right? So the the, the butterflies that are that have migrated south are, are now diapausing now over the winter. This is kind of another fancy term that you can throw out to some of your friends. A heterodynamic life cycle. And I kind of like saying that. It's kind of fun, maybe a good Scrabble word. Uh, heterodynamic uh, life cycle essentially means that the uh, adults, um, sorry, the there is a stage that is a resistant stage and um, the adults are seasonal and that the winter is spent as some other life stage and that stage is typically longer lived. And it can be virtually, so if you look at this kind of chart, this kind of um, picture on the left, you can see that crickets, for instance, um, they have multiple generations, but once they hit September, they overwinter, they spend the winter as this nymph stage. And that nymph stage doesn't undergo any more molting or egg laying until it hits the spring. And a lot of insects will engage with that. 
virtually all insects here in New England that spend the winter have a life stage like this. And I know it's pretty rare that you can say all and you know all of anything in the science world. But as far as I know, and I think I believe as far as anyone else knows, that any insects that spend the winter here in New England have a heterodynamic life cycle where they're just constantly doing this. Um, and this, uh, you know, can be anything. It can be an egg, like you can see here in the case of a, a mantis, a praying mantis or a Chinese mantis, that's going to spend the winter as these egg, egg sacs, these oothica. Uh, in the case of your uh, red spotted admirals and your viceroys, they're going to spend their, their time as the larval stage, the caterpillar. So even this this part here, even though it looks like a cocoon, there's actually a caterpillar dwelling within that, that is diapausing in that larval stage. And then the pupil stage, this is a cecropia moth cocoon. You can see that's the pupil stage. And then the adult stage for your morning cloak butterfly, they're actually spending the winter as these adults. Uh, in general, yeah, insects will tend to pick either the egg or the pupil stage, just because those tend to be inactive stages where mostly gases are exchanged. And I believe that some people think that they may be more tolerant of cold temperatures, but I think in some cases they're not necessarily more cold tolerant, but um, you may find them because they're, they're already going to be inactive. But there are strategies to being uh, a larva or being an adult. For instance, if you're a larva, you now you don't have to worry about hatching at bud break, as soon as those leaves, that first flush of leaves comes out, you're our caterpillar ready to munch on those fresh leaves. Or if you're an adult, you're now ready to seek a mate or or lay eggs right as soon as uh, temperatures get warmer. So there, again, there are strategies to, to all four of these life stages. So let's talk a little bit about diapause and what it means. Uh, insects undergo diapause, which is that uh, kind of a period where it's like inactivity. So they're not going to grow. They're not going to molt. They just, it's almost like hibernation. You can think of it like hibernation in, in, in other species. And this is a special type of rest because it's genetically programmed into that insect. And diapause can either be what we call obligate, where it's based on the timing of a stage in that insect. So once that, once that insect hits the larval stage or the pupil stage or the adult stage, it automatically will diapause regardless of the temperature or environmental conditions. It will just undergo that diapause. That's what we call obligate diapause, right? And th that diapause can vary, the timing of that can vary year to year based on temperatures, for instance. Like if it's a very warm year, maybe the insects will go through um, that each of their individual life stages very quickly and hit that, di that life stage that diapauses sooner than others. So that may vary from year to year, but in general, it's gonna be right around the same time, right? And obligate diapause tends to be found more readily in species of insects that you only see one generation per year. Um, this contrasts with facultative diapause, which tends to be found more often in insects that undergo multiple generations per year. And what facultative diapause is, is it's triggered by certain conditions, right? So that might be something like photo period or a cooling of the of the of of the of the seasons, right? Or something similar. It could even be triggered by something like food, for instance. Like if food is running out, that may trigger a, a, an insect to undergo diapause, right? It, and it's preemptive, so it's forward thinking, right? It can improve cold tolerance, but it's not necessarily caused by cold, right? Uh, I'm not sure what happened here. I think I uh, did something weird. Okay. So uh, let's talk about what triggers diapause. So it, it kind of like Sleeping Beauty, right? What you have is a sensitive stage and that experience some kind of change, right? And that triggers that diapause stage. And the diapause actually ends in response to a token stimulus as well. So it's very similar to Sleeping Beauty, where Sleeping Beauty, you know, she pricks her finger on that spinning wheel. That's the stimulus, like, like a uh, changing photo period, that triggers um, her to fall asleep, and then she that that sleep ends in response to a token stimuli. And during that entire time where she's sleeping, nothing will wake her up. 
only that token stimulus or token stimuli will wake her up. So in diapausing insects, when summer hits or spring hits, they may only wake in response to maybe increased moisture events or maybe increased warming temperatures or something like that will trigger them. But something like, but during that time when they're sleeping, nothing, they're not, they're not responsive to any other environmental cues. Here's a good example. Um, this is a blowfly fly called California vicina. Um, and the adult is sensitive to daylight hours, right? So longer days, this adult will produce normal larva. But once, temp once daylight becomes shorter, she'll actually lay eggs containing larva. And those larva will diapause in the third instar. So she won't, she, so she, so daylight hours will trigger her to then lay different eggs, right? So it could even be a, the next generation is, is that, that, that's the generation that diapauses, right? So the short days cause a change in her, which then cause, causes her to lay different types of larva. This is uh, in contrast with something called quiescence, which is different. And that is um, a period of rest, just like diapause, but done in response to um, a negative stimulus, a negative, uh, a, a negative uh, response. So you can think about maybe the way that you feel when you're being overwhelmed at work, right? Maybe, maybe you have a lot of people that are like, do this. And by the way, you, you got this wrong. And maybe your kids are asking you for new toys or crying at you. And the only thing you want to do is go to sleep, right? That's like quiescence. So it's immediate. It's not forward thinking. And you can still be woken up. Like if someone comes in and, you know, says like, oh, like time to cook dinner or time to, you, you have bills that you need to pay. They need to be done now. You can still respond to that right? Um, and most importantly, you can rapidly return to a normal state. For instance, let's say a friend invites you out to go to a party, right? So all of a sudden, you are no longer stressed, you are no longer tired, and you can immediately go back to that party and you have all the energy in the world, right? So that's like what quiescence is. And insects can do both. They, so they can die pause and they can go through periods of quiescence. In reality, what happens is the insects will die pause in the winter. And then once they hit, they're actually most insects now are undergoing a period of quiescence, right? So a lot of insects will diapause until about midwinter. And then once we hit the late winter, they're going to go into a period of quiescence, right? And so that way they can rapidly return to that normal state as soon as temperatures are warm enough or you, know, you have bud break or you have flowers blooming or something else that allows them to become active. Insects also have responses to water, and it's you might be scratching your head at this point and saying, well, water is life. Why would insects need to worry about water? And there's a good reason why insects need to worry about water when it comes to winter and surviving winter. And that's because a lot of times winter can be also deadly to insects if water comes in contact with their cuticle and can cause direct injury to them. And even water within their bodies can actually be very deadly to insects as well. And so there are two main strategies that insects use to survive the winter um, and survive water and specifically, and that's through freeze tolerance and freeze avoidance, right? Um, but let's talk about why uh, insects might need to survive wa um, these, uh, water in addition to touching, um, in, uh, touching water. And I think this is kind of cool, even though it might be a little technical. Um, so what... I didn't realize um, initially before I started learning about, you know, the way insects survive winter is that water can actually be cooled below zero degrees. I know you learned in in high school and maybe even elementary school, zero degrees or 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature that water freezes. But that's not actually true necessarily. Water will actually, you can actually drop water below zero degrees and it will not become ice, as illustrated in this example of a water bottle that is liquid water and then being poured out into a bowl and freezing as the water touches that bowl. And that's because water can be super cooled below that zero degree mark, right? What water needs in order to form ice is a nucleus. And that's going to be a, a, um, a collection of water molecules that will bond, bind together and start to form that that crystal lattice that forms ice right um and so what the way the insects handle this right is if the nucleus never forms right 
then they can be cooled below zero and ice crystals won't form in and in, in kill them, right? Because they're they're avoiding that freeze from happening, right? By preventing that nucleus from forming. And then in the freeze tolerant species, they're purposefully um, causing that nucleus to form, but they're causing that nucleus to form in locations that are what we might deem as safe locations. And these are gonna be locations outside the cells, right? So again, in the freeze tolerant, this is kind of what I, I'm, I'm kind of talking about. Maybe I can better explain it with some diagrams. So in freeze tolerant insects, right, they're, they're gonna try to freeze safely. And they do that by having these nucleating agents, right? You can see on the left here, outside the, um, the cell tissues, right? And those, um, and then when the water freezes, it's gonna be outside these vulnerable locations. And you can see on the chart on the left, on the right, sorry, in the diagram on the right, different insects will freeze the water in different locations, right? Uh, and that can be varied based on species, but they, in general, they're trying to, to push the water out of their cells into these locations where they can freeze solid and have it be okay. And here's an example of how exactly that, why exactly that can be useful. Um, in the goldenrod gallfly, I, I misspelled fly up here, um, this this is a, a, a fly that overwinters in goldenrod. You can see here what your golden uh, what the gall might look like on the right. Um, that can, the larva can survive minus forty or below. I've seen as low as minus fifty five degrees C. So that larva can survive very very low uh, temperatures just by freezing and undergoing this this freeze tolerance. Right. Freeze freeze avoidance is where that insect tries not to freeze by removal of all nucleating agents, right? So the water is still in their body and it's still in their cells, but they're removing all these nucleating agents, like expelling their gut contents and everything to, to prevent themselves from freezing. And this is an example of a Weta. We don't have that here in, in New England, but this is a freeze avoidant species of insect. But sometimes freeze tolerance and freeze avoidance isn't enough. Um, it, for example, this is a springtail, and I know it's not a true insect, but the point that the 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 temperature that this insect freezes, right, overlaps with winter air temperatures in the Arctic, right? Oh, sorry, in the Antarctic, um, which means that this insect actually cannot survive air temperatures despite the fact that it has a very low temperature at which it freezes, right? So this, this uh, springtail actually needs snow cover to buffer those air temperatures. So again, kind of using a combination. And the, the temperatures that certain insects will freeze at is going to vary from species to species. And even amongst uh, species, even within a species, there can be subspecies that will freeze at certain temperatures. And if you move further north, the temperatures that those species freeze at may even be lower than that, right? So there can be variation within many different species and even within the, within the species. So most insects, in order to provide a second layer of insulation, will overwinter in sheltered habitats. Things like leaf litter, snow, soil, decayed tree stumps, stems, underneath barks, even within our homes. And I think that that's relevant at least in turn, at least with this particular um, uh, set series of videos, and that we're talking a lot about maybe what you can do around your home, like what is the impact of leaf litter or leaving out things like stems or having your yard look a little bit more natural. A lot of insects may depend on these habitats. And you can see this photo on the right, you can see a carpenter bee overwintering inside a stem. I had the picture of that goldenrod golf, golf fly overwintering in kind of those stands of goldenrod that you may think have long since passed. Um, you've got a, a bald-faced hornet that is overwintering underneath a, a log. Uh, and you've got some fire, a firefly larva that may be overwintering close to the soil underneath leaves. So there are many different strategies that insects use. And we're not even sure of all the different strategies in all the different insects in our area and how they may spend the winter. And so it's kind of as a good rule of thumb, leaving your yard and leaving that cleanup, maybe kind of delaying um, what you called fall cleanup and pushing that into maybe 
spring cleanup or maybe just doing as little cleanup as possible may have a very uh, large impact on how many insects get to live into the next year. And just kind of some uh, and more diagrams on kind of how much of a difference um, soil and bark can protect insects from cold. Like you can see um, air temps here being minus 43, uh, well, minus 44 degrees. And underneath the soil, you know, it being markedly warmer, right? And then in the, the at the bottom, you can see where they've taken uh, air temps from another location, and it's about minus 24 degrees. And then underneath tree bark, it's really not that much warmer, but underneath the soil it is, is much, much warmer. So bark in general and stems are not as protective as spending the winter underneath soil. And another example of how much leaves and snow can protect from cold. This is an example, this is a chart taken from a tick study, but I want you to pay attention to these areas right here. Um, the bottom line represents the air temp, where the temperature per red uh, for the air temp. And then the top line, the top orangish yellow line represents a temperature probe placed underneath leaves and snow. And what you can see here is that the ambient air temp was minus 23 degrees C, and then the underneath leaves and snow was minus three degrees C, right? And in Fahrenheit, that's a difference of almost 40 degrees, right? So leaves and snow are very, very protective when it comes to keeping insects, um, and in this case, ticks, alive in an area. So as soon as you kind of rake your yard and you pile up those leaves in another location, that area within your yard becomes almost inhabitable to the insects around. Forests are incredibly important for, um, for insects. In particular, what we're noticing is, is bees, right? And I know this is a talk on all insects, but, and there, but I just want to really kind of spread that awareness that forests are, are so, so important and trees are very important. Um, what we found, what we know about bees, especially maybe not honeybees, but when it comes to our native bees, that the most vulnerable part of a bee's life cycle is going to be winter, right? And I, I mean, I guess that's even true for honeybees where, where winter, you get a lot of mortality for honeybees in the winter. But um, what we know about forests is that they're likely critical in the survival of these native bees because uh, the native bees have a solitary um, or especially bumblebees will have a solitary phase where the queen will spend the winter somewhere. We believe it's in forests and that's it, right? And what happens to her during that time is going to influence the trajectory of the entire next season. So if she doesn't make it through winter, that's an entire hive that will not be born the next year. Or if she has a very rough time, then she may produce a, a, a fewer offspring that next year. So, it, so what happens to that overwintering queen is incredibly important. So forests, very, very important. And the more trees you can have in and around your property, very, very important because we also know that um, early pollen sources are mostly going to be found amongst trees, right? Um, willow is incredibly important. Early maple is very, very important for, for early uh, emerging bees. So trees, that's something that you can definitely do in and around your yard is think about how the trees impact your yard. And if you can stand to have certain trees, you know, I'm not telling people to, if they have a, a deadly tree that is leaning over their yard to leave it there. But if you can potentially leave it, if you're trying to think, thinking about taking trees down for aesthetic purposes, um, maybe you want, might want to consider leaving them. I do want to talk a little bit about climate change, especially while we're talking about the ways in which insects can survive winters. Um, as temperatures warm, I think in general, most people think, well, there can, there's going to be mostly positive impacts on insects, or maybe, the in, maybe there's going to be negative impacts only when it gets too hot in the summer. But there could actually be negative impacts on the ways that insects survive the winter as well. For instance, what if there's lack of snow cover? We just talked about how important snow cover is for buffering those air temperatures and protecting those insects from being exposed to the very, very frigid uh, air temps, right? So if it's less, if it's not as cold, maybe there won't be as much snow cover and maybe it will still be cold enough in the air to kill those insects. Um, there may be increased water and that may lead to increased ice formation. And when water and ice touch certain insects, that can actually be deadly during um, times of cold. So some insects, what they'll do is they'll seek out 
dry locations where water may not touch them. Um, increased freeze and thaw cycles can have a, a very large uh, play a very large role in whether or not insects make it. For instance, uh, in some insects, they're only freeze tolerant through one freeze cycle, right? So if you have an insect and you freeze it, it will be a freeze tolerant insect. But if you thaw that insect out and you freeze it again, it may not be freeze tolerant ever again, right? So multiple freeze thaw, thaw cycles may actually have a very large impact on the survival of insects the next year. And maybe the timing and duration of diapause, maybe if it's too warm, maybe diapause will be initiated at the wrong time. And again, maybe some potential positive effects. Like uh, for instance, in it, some insects, if you have more generations in the summer months, well maybe you have more uh, larger numbers moving into winter and maybe that may increase uh, the population of insects in a given area. So we're not really sure, right? But some of it can be negative and some of it could be positive. And I think we're not really, we're not going to be sure. Um, so what are some of the things that you all can do to help out, right? Uh, what, what do you actually have control over when it comes to helping out insects in and around your property? Well, I think the importance of habitat is really important and can't be overstated, right? Um, winter site selection can be very, very important. A lot of insects will seek out certain places and because we don't know what locations they're seeking out, having a varied type of habitat can be really important, especially for insects. And then there are some insects that they really can't move, right? And they're going to only overwinter on certain in certain places. Like I showed you that picture of the Cecropia moth and the red spotted purple. They're both going to want to overwinter on cherry trees. So if you've got cherry trees in and around your property, I would you could even consider checking those out and looking for any of those in any of those Lepidoptera that might want, that might be spending the winter on there. I always check all my uh, cherry trees in and around my property or whenever I can um, to see if I find any of those moths or butterflies. And sometimes I do it. It's really exciting when I do. Um, and just in general, varied strategies necessitate varied conditions. So leaving the leaves, um, you know, just kind of being, you might even want to be lazy about it, right? You can, a lot of people will look at you and be like, oh, that person's lazy. I, I was taking a walk around my neighborhood and there was one woman who was like, I don't know if she was being passive aggressive to me or what, but she was like, people in this neighborhood don't maintain their properties the way they should. And, um, you know, me being the crazy bug guy that lives in the neighborhood, I'm wondering if she was just thinking about me, <laughs> but my yard looks a little messy this time of year. I try to clean areas where I know my family is going to be spending time. Um, but in general, I do like to leave the leaves uh, anywhere that I can especially even knowing that um, those areas could be harboring ticks. I think that there's more good than bad that is coming out of it. Um, and, and I have a lot of fireflies in my yard and knowing that all of those leaves may be providing habitat and uh, a nice blanket for those fireflies to survive. It's a simple, you know, just don't rake, right? It, it, and maybe deal with your, the Karens that are walking around your yard or the um, bobs or whatever, whatever the Kyles I think they use for, for men. Um, save the stems. Um, you know, on the top left, you've got goldenrod galls uh, formed and chickadees are going to eat that, but also those flies are going to be living in there. And on the right, you have bees that are overwintering inside those stems. So as much as you can do, make sure you keep these around. Uh, again, very, very simple, not too hard to do. Reduce artificial light at night. Um, what we're finding is, so what we know is, is that artificial light, night, light at night, um, we're considering pollution these days, right? So light pollution is pollution. And a lot of times people use this in the context of protecting things like night flying insects, moths, um, fireflies, all these insects that might depend on very, very dark environments in order to survive. But what we're also learning is that it might actually influence the onset of diapause as well. Like if you think about diapause being triggered by photo period, and if now you have artificially extended the light cycle of, of your area, um, what does that do? And in one study, what we found is a four week delay in diapause in insects that were living in urban environments compared to rural environments. In these areas where you have a lot of street lights and a lot of lights at night, signs from stores and shops being left on, 
it, it actually caused a delay in that in the insects to die pause. Uh, what may also be playing a role is that the urban environments acting as heat shields and in increasing heat may also influence die pause as well. So that might have also been a factor in that first study, but I'm not sure. But it's something to think about, right? So if you can keep your your house as dark, you know, you're saving electricity, you're helping insects during the summer months, you're going to be helping them in the winter months as well. Again, it's not too hard to do. And what they've also found is that reducing light at night may actually reduce crime in an area too. A lot of times people think it, that they're safer if they leave them at light at night. And that might be true if you're worried about tripping on things. But if you're worried about people breaking into your house, um, what they found is that turning lights off may actually help more with that as well. Um, and lastly, um, you would want to promote your local conservation groups as well, because conservation, you know, there's really no replacement for conservation. Um, that's going to be kind of, you know, you can try to restore an area, but you're never really going to get it back to the way that it used to be. Once you lose species in an area, you kind of want to restore function, but it's never going to be the exact same thing. So conserving an area is always going to be better. Uh, for further reading on maybe overwintering habitat and how insects nest in overwintering habitat, uh, I recommend reading this. It's a very quick read um, put out by the Xerces Society. And you can just kind of Google nesting overwinter habitat pollinators for Xerces. And there's a lot of stuff that they talk about and kind of recap and maybe a little bit less dense than maybe what you've heard tonight. Um, and at this point, I, I'll take any questions. I know it's a little bit on the shorter end. Uh, maybe the material is a little dense as well, but um, I hope that you all kind of got something out of it and that you enjoyed the presentation. Um, and at this point, I'm, I'd be happy to answer any questions that might have come through. Okay, we've got a couple of questions. The first one says, I left an area of leaves over the winter for insect habitat. In the upcoming spring, if I want to clean the area up, how long should I wait? When do most insects move out? So the the real answer is that, um, and I I feel like I've been giving this answer a lot to different groups that I've been going to. Um, you, the ideal is that you leave those leaves forever. You let them break down on your lawn and you leave them there forever because they're going to be used and the nutrients are going to be recycled back into the um, into the ground, um, and they're going to be provide, providing food and resources for things developing there. Um, but you want to find a happy medium with what you're happy with, 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 with the, what you can tolerate, right? So not everyone can tolerate just leaving the leaves an, anywhere. So you want to leave them as long as you can tolerate. So if that's April, then, then you rake them in April, right? If that's May, you rake them in May. And if that's June, you rake them in June. Um, in general, if you wait until maybe around May or June, around that time frame, you're, you're going to, there's going to be you're going to, there's going to be a wave of insects that like to emerge in the spring and all those are going to be kind of done. Right. And so you're going to be helping out a lot of those, but um, if you leave them there longer, it's going to be more beneficial. Right. So there's no real cutoff point. And you can find that online. You people will say like, Oh, wait until like Memorial day, but that's not really true because the longer you leave them, it's still going to be providing benefit. It's just whatever you find to be comfortable. Right. Um, if you want to use that Memorial day as a, as a kind of a mark, like a, a a field mark or a benchmark a benchmark that you can kind of wait for, then then do that. But um, I'd recommend leaving them there as long as possible. And what I do is I just rake the areas that I know are going to be heavily used, um, and I leave the leaves everywhere else. Okay, the next one says excellent. I almost didn't join the webinar because well bugs, but I'm glad I did. So much info, so much variety. Loved learning about bugs and how to help them. The question is, is there a way, safe way to remove nuisance bugs in a veggie garden that will not harm others? Uh, well, I, first off, I appreciate the kind words. I'm glad that you got a lot out of it. And I'm glad that you joined despite the, the bugs factor. Um, so that's, yeah, that's really nice. Um, secondly, uh, what I recommend with removing any pest insects is something called integrated pest management, which is thinking about that particular insect that you're targeting and going from really least toxic to down. And basically you go from the, you start with the least toxic methods and you kind of move up to more general methods. So you do like a more specific method that is targeted at that particular insect. 
And if that's not really working, you kind of move up the chain until you get to like the very end, which might be application of a of a generalized pesticide, right? Um, so if you think about the nuisance insect that you're talking about, um, there may be something that you can do to manage that, perhaps um, placing netting over that particular vegetable at a specific time of year, or it could be um, maybe uh, the use of a pesticide that is very specific to that type of pest and won't really have a lot of collateral damage to other insects in that area. So again, it would kind of depend on that insect you're trying to target. Um, it could be something like, for instance, if you know, I, I was, it, it could be something like maybe even tilling a garden so that some of the things like maybe um, squash vine borer, which will spend, the, which is a native insect that I love, but a lot of people don't like squash vine borer. Uh, I don't want to promote killing of that, but I know a lot of people do want to get rid of it. Um, if you till an area that may help mitigate the emergence of squash vine borer in that particular area, because it spends the winter as a, as a pupa underneath the soil. So by tilling it, you're killing that pupa and it's not gonna emerge as an adult in your garden the, the next year, right? So again, that would minimize that you wouldn't be spraying anything that would kill bees or anything. You'd just be tilling that area. Um, okay, the next one is, is my yard with leaves left on the ground enough to save insects if all my neighbor's yards have no leaves? It's gonna save some insects. Um, but what we do know is that with all of these things, it's it's going to be the more it's going to it's going to be about landscape level changes, right? So if none of your neighbors are doing it, um, it's not great. It, it's, it makes me sad. But my hope, at least my hope with me too, is that by me doing this, it's going to normalize the idea of that happening, right? And so while some people may complain about it in my neighborhood, um, I'm going to keep doing it, right? And hopefully that normalizes it. And my kids are going to be exposed to this. It's going to normalize it for them. And I do talk to other kids in, in the area and other people in the area. And the hope is that it's maybe not going to be immediate, the change, but maybe over a long period of time, um, we're going to hopefully change that behavior. Um, insects will survive. The insects in your yard will survive um, underneath those leaves if you leave them. Um, it's just going to be better if it's a larger area, right? So that's all what we want is to shoot for these very large areas, these large swaths of land where we can protect many, many insects versus being like one rock star within a small location. It's, it's, it's going to be better over, over a long period of time. Okay. The next person has two questions. Number one, are there in, <coughs> endangered insects in this area? Uh, sure. Um, so there are endangered insects in this area. There are state endangered insects, and there are also federally endangered insects as well. Um, so there are insects that are only endangered within Massachusetts, but they're not considered endangered nationwide. And then there are endangered ones that are endangered nationwide. Um, those, I'm trying to think if they are, if any of them are going to be super dependent on leaving the leaves and saving the stems. Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to get back to you. I'd have to look. I don't know off the top of my head. But what I, I can say in, in terms of endangered insects, quote unquote, is that there are likely other insects in our area that could be classified as endangered that we just don't have the population data on to know. They may either be just very cryptic, hard to identify, or or hard or, or hard to find, right? Um, for instance, there may be certain firefly species that they could be endangered in our area, but um, there may not be enough people that are collecting population data on firefly species, right? Um, or there could be, say, a scorpion fly species that we're not sure they could be endangered right now, or maybe even a stink bug species that may be endangered that people are just not collecting population data on. Okay, part two of that question is the number of insects declining, stable, or increasing? That is a very that is a, that is a question that I have an entire uh, fifty minute presentation dedicated to. Um, and um, what the answer to that question is is um, some insects are declining, some insects are increasing, right? Overall, it, it, it's hard to gather. And then you, you have such a complicated um, sets of data and they don't all 
there's always there's there's flaws with every single one of them, right? So um, this all started back in 2017, where we had that study out of Germany that showed a 20 set over 27 years there was a 75 percent decline in insect biomass, and then that kind of um, spurred a number of different studies, and a few of them came out in the 2020s, like right during COVID. And what they found is that in general, what you had is about 1%-ish declines in terrestrial insects, so flying insects and insects that are found on land. And then they saw increases in aquatic insects. There were, they were you know, like things like dragonflies and things like uh, water beetles and, and, and things like that living in the water. And those were increasing either in abundance or diversity. And then you had, in some cases, the insects were staying the same. There were neither, no declines. So, and then what, and the thing is a lot of that, those data come out of studies from North America and Europe, right? And so what is happening in the rest of the world and places that we can't really get to or don't have a lot of data on, we're not really sure, right? So my thoughts behind that is that insects, what we know are declining in general, right? So we, well, I think the general consensus is that they're declining. They might not be collapsing or it might not be the apocalypse, but in general, what we're finding is that insect diversity or abundance, or in some cases, is mostly going down. Sometimes insects are going, up, species are going up, but some are, but most are going down. Um, and in general, I think that that's bad, right? Um, even if it's not an apocalypse, I don't want to have to wait for an apocalypse to happen for people to start caring, right? So I think what we should all just start caring now, whether or not they're declining by one percent, five percent, or seventy-five percent. It should just be something that we start doing. Um, and we can kind of get lost in the weeds about what the decline is, but I don't think that really matters, right? I don't think that the specifics of it really matter when it comes to comes down to it. Um, we're in kind of in this mindset, even going, I'm, I'm going to get on like my TED talk, get on my soapbox. And we're kind of in this mindset of um, waiting for things to become endangered before we start caring about them, right? So I had that question about, um, are there any endangered insects? And humans in general, we wait for things to, to, to almost lose them before we start caring, right? But we shouldn't do that, right? We should we should care about things before that point when all the connections of of so, so if you have an endangered insect, it, it sounds maybe cynical, but if that went away, there most often nothing, very little will be influenced by that because it's endangered. Not a lot of species are dependent on it. But if you have an insect and it has a large population, right? A lot of things, birds and other insects and predators are all, and the, the plants are all gonna be dependent on, there are all these connection webs that that insect is very, very important, right? So we also wanna care about those insects that are very populous, that are very common, because those are where all the connections that support our ecosystems and ecologies are at. So we, again, we don't wanna wait to, to hammer those down and break all those connections to start caring about them and then try to rebuild those connections. We start caring about those things na right now, right right today. That's the end of my TED talk. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I don't want to yell at you guys all night, right? The next question is, are there invasive non-native bugs that we need to worry about in this area? What can we do if so? Oh yeah, there are definitely non-native insects and um, uh what can we do? I mean, it, it depends on the, the invasive insect that you're referring to. In some cases, there's not much we can do besides reporting that particular insect to the state. I mean, that's what the state is asking with um, spotted lanternfly right now. Um, that's been found a number of times within Plymouth County, and they're asking that you um, don't try to take matters into your own hands, that you, you really just report that insect now, and then after you report it, then they they come out and they're they're going to try to do what they need to do to manage it. But then there and the, but then there are other invasive insects that you do have the the control over, and the 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 state is basically saying we're not going to do anything about that. It's a homeowner's issue. And then for those, there there's going to be things like maybe pesticides or maybe some controls that you can use to manage those. So it really depends on the the invasive insect you're referring to. But we have a a number of invasive insects in our area that at least are on my radar that I that I'm a little bit worried about. If you want more inf information on invasives, I'm trying to coordinate uh, a few different presentations on that. So you can reach out to me. Um, maybe we can set something up on that if, you, if you're really interested in that. Okay. The next one says, great presentation. Thank you very much. Is there anything I can do to attract predatory insects like ladybugs or lacewings for my garden? 
and do predatory nematodes ever survive our winters? Uh, so um, the, for predatory insects like, like ladybugs and lacewings, um, in terms of like making them like a biological control, the kind of the issue with that is that, or the challenge really with it, it's not really an issue, it's a challenge, is that they're never really gonna eat all the prey down to nothing. So there, there's always gonna be a level of prey and a prey infestation within a garden. The only times that they're very effective at reducing all of that prey is when they're in an enclosed environment like a greenhouse. So if you have a greenhouse and you've got an outbreak of say aphids, you could introduce ladybugs into that area and they're gonna eat almost all of those aphids because they have nothing else to eat in that area, right? And so then they may die of starvation. But in general, what's going to happen is once that population of aphids declines, they're going to disperse and they're going to find prey in other locations. And they're just naturally going to disperse anyways and move outward. So um, it's tough. So what you can do to really kind of attract them, you're probably already attracting them by having prey. Like if you have aphids in your garden, that's going to attract ladybugs and lacewings to your garden. Um, you may still have the aphids. Um, what you would not want to do is kill all of those aphids with a pesticide, because then that may cause a decline in the number of predators in that area that may have more difficulty bouncing back, right? Um, so that that may that may happen. So having a low level of those aphids, if you can tolerate it, is going to have the predators around. Um, they're just not going to maybe have the impact that you want on that garden. Um, in terms of nematodes, um, I I'm not certain. How many? How well nematodes survive our winters? I know that um, at least the last thing that I read on them was was from from a few years ago. They were saying that in general they they're they're not great at surviving our winters. So uh, I think that there was some survival with certain species. Um, I can't recall that species off the top of my head, but I think they were surviving a few years um, and then needed to be like replenished. They they didn't like really sustain themselves, but. Um, I mean, as winters get warmer, maybe nematodes will be more of an option. I don't know. It's something I would have to look into and then and then get back to you on that. Okay. The next person says, I use leaves as mulch in flower beds. Is there a max and a minimum level to be beneficial? Yes. Um, I don't know that max off the top of my head, like what it is, like two feet off the ground or one foot off the ground. But if you put too much, too many leaves and you stack them up too high, then a lot of the stuff, so some of the stuff our natives will actually can push up through the uh, leaf layer, but if that's stacked too high, it's going to still cover them and they're still not going to be able to push up through that. I, again, I don't know what that that limit is. Again, I don't know if it's like a, a foot or two feet or three feet. I'm not sure. I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. But there is, there is a max that, that you will hit. The next All person right. said, I tried no mo may a few years ago. When it came time to mow, the tractor went on the fritz. After it was fixed, I had amber waves of grain and my wife accused me of a plot to get out of mowing. Now she has limited me to a small patch only. Any other approaches to accomplishing the same? Thank you. Okay, um, so I'm. Um, this is a hot take. I'm actually not a fan of no mow may at all. I, I really don't like it. Um, and that's because I think it should just be like, no mow all summer like it, it shouldn't just be may because once again like people are looking for a, a, a period of of the year where it's okay to have this wild part of their year and then not okay another another time but if you only do no mow may and then you mow at the start of june um most of our fireflies peak in june and here's a reason why you want to keep that so let me back up here's a reason why you want to do no mow all summer right um, and just within the context of fireflies, right? So fireflies, a lot of them will peak in June. You get the most number of species right at the tail end of June, right? Right around the summer solstice. The females of many firefly species like tall grass. So if you're mowing right before those fireflies start reproducing, that's not helpful, right? So it may be helpful for some, for some insects, but then you're not helping fireflies, right? So you're 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 almost harming them, right? So it's it's not great, right? And then so at least um, what a lot of people have saying is kind of like the impetus for no mow may is that you get flowers that grow up in your lawn. But a lot of the flowers, at least that I have in my yard, um, growing up in my lawn, are non-native. Things like dandelions, things like um, bittercress, 
things like Creeping Charlie that are really not that great for bees anyways. They're, they're not really the best. So just not mowing for those flowers that come up in your yard. Uh, like, you know, even like clover is, is not great. Um, so, I mean, bumblebees and, and some honeybees and honeybees will like it, but not a lot of the solitaries are really going to like that. So I wouldn't really do it specifically for those reasons. So that, that's kind of like why I don't really like no mow may. What I would recommend doing instead of no mow may, and this is what I do, is I have an area of, I have an area of my yard. It's set up in the back, right? And I have broken that down into thirds, right? So one on the left and then the middle and then the right. And then I mow that, I mow basically a third of that every month, right? So at each given time, you've got a period of that grass that is gonna be like a, up to two months old, right? And so that way you have the grass growing in and you're just keep creating a set of diversified habitats in that backyard where you mow different strips, right, in thirds. And so that's what I recommend. And you get, again, the diversity, you get, you always have firefly habitat. You always have flowers in another area. You always have, you have all this, this different spread. And I get the most diversity in that part of my yard. The next question is, why are there so many stink bugs? <laughs> so um, stink bugs, um, if people are referring to the brown marmorated stink bug, um, I couldn't really tell you, but in if it's the Western conifer seed bug, which a lot of people call stink bugs, they're the more elongate brown stink bug that you might find in your house. And they've got flared, it almost looks like bell bottoms on their legs. Um, they also stink when you squish them. So people, I think that's why people call them stink bugs. Um, they are herbivores on pine cones. And if your area was anything like my area, it's got a lot of white pine and it had a lot of white pine cones last year. I believe we call that a mast year with, with pine trees. And so I, I'm guessing that created a boom in the population of those Western conifer seed bugs. Because I have so many Western conifer seed bugs in my house. And I think that it's more than just a correlate, you know, more, you know, more than just a correlation between the, the mass years, of, which is the food supply for those Western conifer seed bugs, and the numbers of species of the Western conifer seed bugs coming into my house, or number, sorry, not the number of species, the number of individuals coming to my house. Okay. Is there any truth to the color of the woolly bear caterpillar indicating the strength of the winter? No, that's uh, based on a study, I believe from the 1950s in my right around there right around the mid-century of, of, of the 19 the mid 1900s where they recorded a series of winters and it seemed like there was a correlation between the bands of the woolly bear caterpillar and the severity of the winter season um, since then they've tried to recreate that study a number of times and they found that it's basically just was just a correlation was just a fluke that that first particular study had that so it's a fun thing to think about um, in the same way that, you know, you might pick up a penny and think it's good luck. It's, it's, or the groundhog day, you know, predicting the start of spring. It's kind of fun in that way, but there's no real scientific basis behind it. Okay. Can you refresh our memories about the wonderful reasons we should worry about tick populations remaining high? <laughs> um, I don't, uh, you know, there are, the tick populations are, you know, they're, they're pretty high, but at least here in Massachusetts, um, we don't see a lot of fluctuation year to year. What I will say, um, well, what I will caution people about is this particular spring, and I should probably make a Facebook post about this, but this particular spring has been relatively warm and adult deer ticks, um, they go through a, a period of, of they're, they're basically quiescent when it comes to, so we, going back to the, 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 the presentation, they're quiet, they go through quiescence in the, in the winter. So when it gets below freezing, they chill out, but above freezing, they're active. So anytime we have temps above in the forties and above, they're going to be very, very active. And you may feel that the populations are larger, but it's really just that the warmer it is, the more activity you're going to experience. And you may pick up a lot of ticks. And there are, um, I mean, living here on the on the coast of Massachusetts, we're living really at ground zero when it comes to, to deer tick populations. There are very few locations in the country that are worse than where we're living. Okay. Can you comment on jumping worms? Are they a problem locally? Uh, jumping worms kind of going along with the invasive insects are, um, they're a non-native 
species of worm. They are, um, their impact, I think, is uh, not fully un understood. Um, the way that jumping, for anyone not familiar with jumping worms, they're an Asian species of worm. New England, um, during the last glaciation, um, lost most, but I know pe people say there are no native earthworms in New England, but we do actually have a few, a couple native worms, but they have no significant impact on the decomposition decomp of leaf litter. So any of the stuff that, any of the worms that use for composting um, and breaking down leaf litter, those are all non-native worms. So are things like your red wigglers or your night crawlers, those are all non-native. And those invaded our country in like the 1600s, right? They're the first invasion of, of, of worms. Um, and they do have a negative impact on our local ecology. The concern now is we are going are now undergoing a second wave of invasive earthworms, these Asian ferritomoid earthworms that people call it jumping worms are now invading. In addition, so now we have the invasive European worms and now we have the invasive jumping worms, right? And so what does that do now to our local ecology? Is it gonna be like a one-two punch where our spring ephemerals are being knocked down by the European worms and now they're gonna be hit again by the jumping worms? We don't know, right? Or is it just gonna be like a net zero where these jumping worms push out the European worms? We're not sure. I think my advice is that if you have jumping worms, um, don't first, don't panic. Secondly, try to treat them as if they would be really bad and don't spread them to anyone else. Um, if you already do have them, there is plenty. Uh, there are plenty of plants that still will grow in your yard and be a okay and be just fine. Um, they seem to have a different effect on different native plants. Like they're really bad um, on Solomon seal and maple saplings, but they're but a lot of other a lot of other native plants grow just fine in the presence of jumping worms. So you can still grow plants, but um, treat them as if they would be bad. Um, if you have them, but don't panic. And unfortunately. I'm saying don't panic because there's no real legal way that we can get rid of them. So you just kind of have to deal with them. Okay. Many are using creeping thyme to replace grass in their lawns. Does this harm any of our native insects or is this a more beneficial alternative for our native insects? I'm not familiar with this trend of creeping thyme to replace grass. Um, so I'm not I'm not really sure if it if it harms or hurts. Um, I know like uh, a lawn of Kentucky bluegrass is is basically effect effectively pavement. So if, if creeping thyme, even if it, I don't I don't know if creeping thyme is native or non-native. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but if it, even if it's non-native, um, if it's doing something more than our grass, you know maybe I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't seen any data on it. I, it's something that I would have to look into. Um, interesting question. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't have a good answer for that. Okay, that's the end of our questions. Thank you, Blake, for presenting tonight. And I wanna thank everybody for coming and I hope you'll join us tomorrow night to hear Doug Tallamy. Thank you all so much and I hope you enjoyed it. Have a good night. Good night.